Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. We will begin in just a minute here. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for joining us. Hello everyone and welcome to today's keynote webinar titled Transforming the Clinical Lab Through Equity, Inclusion and Diversity. This webinar is a part of the 14th annual event in the Clinical Diagnostics and Research Virtual Event Series. I am Sydney McNeil of Lab Roots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Lab Roots. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to first participate by communicating with other attendees using our live chat feature during the presentation. You can find the live chat located at the bottom left of your screen. You can also participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Submit. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the help desk button from within the lobby. Finally, as a reminder, today's presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits image located on the right of your screen and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now let's get started. I now present today's speaker, Linda Hazadzri, Director, Molecular Technologies Laboratory, Chair of Equity, Inclusion and Diversity, Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic. For a complete biography on our speaker, please find it on the left of your screen. Linda, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Sydney, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today on this journey through EID um, here at the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, or DLMP for short, at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. All right. So let's start with discussing health disparities. What are they? So health disparities are um, variations in how different population groups access, experience, um, and receive healthcare. These are often influenced by socioeconomic and other disadvantages. And um, one thing to note is that these are preventable differences oftentimes. And so what is equity, inclusion, and diversity then, or EID for short? Um, it's easy to conflate these concepts together. And so that's why I'd like to just briefly go through the definitions. And I want to point out that adopting EID, of course, um, can lead to more successful organizations and therefore improved healthcare outcomes. And so starting with diversity, diversity is, of course, all the myriad ways in which we differ from one another. Um, equity is um, how we differ from one another doesn't matter. Uh, what we identify as, for instance, can't predict our outcome. And inclusion is having a variety of people or all of us, despite the ways in which we differ, um, empowered to be part of decision-making processes, um, having a voice, et cetera. And so one thing I do want to um, quickly distinguish is um, the distinction between equity and equality, as this is often a source of confusion. Um, and also because as we've learned through time, equality itself for providing equal access to knowledge and resources is often insufficient. You need equity as well. And so on the image on the left, you can see a visual depiction of what equality is. Equality is, you know, all three individuals here have access to this beautiful mountain view um, and all of them are supported in order to view that. But as you can see, not all of them have the same view. Equity, on the other hand, as opposed to equality, 
is not just access to that view, it is supporting all of those individuals so they have the same access to that view. So it's not enough to just have a seat at the table. Um, you also have to be given the same tools and resources as your colleagues um, in order for us to truly achieve equity. And so look at that image and then imagine how even better it would be if we just remove the barriers to equity and equality in the first place, i.e. in this case, we got rid of the wall or the fence. And so everybody enjoys the same view. Everybody can contribute, everybody's in, and therefore everybody wins. And so in the clinical lab then, um, our goal in the clinical lab is of course to serve all people, serve and support all people as well as um, all patients. And so what, what are some of the ways um, through which we can achieve this? I'd like to showcase some examples um, here within DLMP, or again, the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology here at Mayo. Um, some of the ways that we are working towards and promoting EID um, in three specific realms, and those are in our lab tests themselves, as well as in some of the research being performed by our staff in the clinical lab, and then in how we actually support our staff in the clinical lab. And so starting with the many um, hundreds of tests uh, that we offer clinically here at Mayo um, to thousands upon thousands of patients actually um, all over the world each year, one way we can um, better serve an increasingly diverse patient population is just by beginning with the language even that we use to describe our tests and how we report results. And so some of this work is being led by uh, one of my colleagues pictured in the upper right corner, Anna Essendrup. She's one of our laboratory genetic counselors here at DLMP. And she has helped pioneer efforts to incorporate practices such as um, in cytogenetic testing, for instance, when a sex chromosome aneuploidy or a different number of sex chromosomes is detected, no longer having um, clinical test reports that go in a patient's chart say things like, abnormal. We know that sex is actually, as well as gender identity and the two should not be conflated, um, is a spectrum and individuals that have different numbers of sex chromosome don't, sex chromosomes don't necessarily have any um, significant clinical manifestations of that. And so to say abnormal could be, you know, offensive, for instance, for a patient to see and experience, and therefore they'll feel marginalized by that laboratory result. And so using terminology simply, um, a sex chromosome complement of 47 XXY was detected in this individual, and just leaving it at that um, can be extremely helpful. Um, also helpful is adopting practices such as renaming our tests. Um, we have one test, for instance, that we perform on all prenatal specimens that we receive called non-maternal cell contamination or maternal cell contamination. Um, and that is where we are testing um, both a sample from the gestational carrier of that pregnancy as well as the, the prenatal sample itself. So amniocentesis fluid or chorionic villi sampling. Um, we are testing both samples to make sure that um, the results that we see in that prenatal specimen are not actually reflective of the DNA of the gestational carrier. They actually reflect the pregnancy or the fetus or fetuses instead. Um, but calling the test, uh, you know, maternal cell contamination or non-maternal cell contamination um, can be marginalizing because not everybody identifies as a mother. For instance, we have an increasing number of um, gestational carriers or surrogate pregnancies, for instance, or individuals, again, who just don't consider themselves a mom. And so to be inclusive of those, perhaps we could rename um, this test non-fetal cell contamination instead or something that removes that term. Um, we can also update the indications for testing, um, you know, on our public facing materials as well as internally. And so um, outdated or colloquial terms or phrases or indications such as quote unquote female hirsutism, what does that even mean? Um, is it, that's more of a qualitative and subjective description than it is an actual clinical indication for testing. And again, that can be marginalizing. Um, also, we can replace outdated or more colloquial phrases such as, for instance, quote unquote, mental retardation um, in our tests, as that can be polarizing as well and marginalizing as well. We can use more current diagnostic terminology or descriptions such as intellectual disability or developmental delay in our test reports. Because again, these go in patients' charts and you don't want loaded phrases, again, that are um, 
marginalizing to be present in those and for the, the patient to experience that. And we can also update, you know, our outward facing education materials as well as our internal documents to have this more updated um, and more clinically accurate terminology instead as well. All right, so focusing now on just one form of diversity, um, which is gender identity. And again, as I mentioned, um, please remember that sex and gender are not um, interchangeable terms or concepts. Um, sex is a biological construct, whereas gender is more social cultural um, or is more personal. And so um, some of the ways that we can um, better serve gender diverse individuals through laboratory tests include um, things like updating our reference ranges um, to, to um, be more inclusive of transgender individuals. For instance, our tests looking at hormone levels. Can we establish transgender specific reference ranges um, so that we don't have results mistakenly or inaccurately going out as being quote unquote abnormal or elevated or low in individuals when in fact they don't, um, I, they may not identify with the sex that they were assigned at birth. Or even um, for tests where you have a sex specific reference range, um, perhaps rephrasing how you refer to that range or how you publish or report that range or include it in your educational materials to instead of just saying um, male and female, for instance, could you add a statement saying, you know, this assumes sex assigned at birth? And that way it's clear what you mean by male or female, or again, just getting rid of um, sex specific ranges wherever possible um, would be helpful. Um, other ways we can incorporate gender inclusivity in um, laboratory testing is just being, um, being able to use or uh, using preferred names as well as preferred gender identities. Um, one of the areas that our department oversees, for instance, is uh, phlebotomy. And so we have individuals who are drawing blood from patients and they often ask for identifiers. And what, when you bring that patient back to have their blood drawn, you, you most typically will ask, you know, what is your name and what's your date of birth? And if an individual has a preferred name that they want you to use as opposed to their legal name and you, um, use their legal name instead, or you quote unquote dead name them, that, that can be a very traumatic experience. And so just incorporating practices of maybe using alternative identifiers, you know, can you give me your legal name or your medical record number instead of um, something that has the potential to traumatize a patient can, can be helpful. Um, a great real life example of um, how we improve gender inclusivity in our laboratory tests was actually um, the educational pamphlets that our institution use, um, uses for midstream urine collection. So a lot of times you have to provide a midstream urine sample for things like urinary, urinary tract infection testing. And um, we previously, or perhaps still currently have two separate pamphlets, one that says male, one that says female, and um, they actually contain what many individuals consider pretty graphic and um, maybe even offensive images in there. And so um, we had a task force um, led by my colleagues, Meredith Vanderhaar, as well as Lindy Grove and Dr. Brooke Katzman that looked into how can we update this? And so first of all, they got rid of the two separate pamphlets for this and they have just one urine collection pamphlet instead. Um, they replaced all of the gendered verbiage in there with more inclusive medical terms. And then they got rid of the really graphic um, and possibly offensive images in there. And so they have um, other relevant images such as the ones on the, the right instead of those more graphic depictions. Okay, so moving on to um, other forms of diversity, namely um, race, ethnicity, and ancestry. Um, another one of our lab genetic counselors, um, Marissa Ellingson, actually helped put together um, guidance on the use of REA data, uh, REA again being short for race, ethnicity, and ancestry, um, in genetic testing. And she worked closely with um, a variety of different groups, including our own um, Dakota Employee Resor Resource Group here at which is um, a pre predominantly um, Native American uh, staff um, formed and led group here um, to come up with, again, guidance on how we can use this um, in genetic testing. And so um, I would just want to share some of the recommendations that she was able to put together. And so before I go into those, though, I want to remind the audience that um, 
REA or race, ethnicity, and ancestry are actually just like sex and gender. Those are not interchangeable terms. Um, race and ethnicity are actually considered more social cultural constructs. And so oftentimes um, in laboratory testing in general, not just genetic testing, there's conflation of these terms and that can lead to confusion amongst providers and patients. Um, in addition to that, using limited reference data, specifically in the realm of genetic testing um, and the use of REA specific risk estimates, um, that can negatively impact results and therefore patient outcomes. Um, if a patient is looking at um, a risk or a REA specific risk estimate for carrier status for a particular genetic disease, and they see the category um, Asians, for instance, what does that mean? Um, and on top of that, an increasing number of patients are of multiple ancestries. And so where do they fit um, when they look at tables like that or information like that? Do they assume that their risk is a combination or an average of, of two different population groups estimates? Um, again, that data is really unclear. And so um, again, just being mindful of this can really help in improving, again, the experience of um, your laboratory tests. And it's really important to consider whether collecting such data is even necessary in the first place. Um, again, in genetic testing in particular, they often ask for this data on the test requisition forms when a provider is ordering one of these tests, but what is it actually used for and how is it used? Um, if we don't actually need it to perform our test and to analyze and interpret the data, and worse yet, if it's actually going to influence our interpretation of the data in a potentially negative way, for instance, if we have a sample from an individual who does not identify as having European ancestry, and we're looking at their DNA sequence for a particular gene, and we're comparing that to a reference genetic sequence from an individual of European ancestry, we might mistakenly think that any variants that we see in the sequence um, could be pathogenic or disease causing because we haven't seen them before. It's something different from the reference sequence. When in fact, if we were to look at reference sequences from other healthy individuals who are of, of the same ancestry of that patient, we might see that, oh, this is actually a common variant in all of these um, healthy controls, therefore it can't be disease causing. And so again, what you're comparing your data to even can make a difference. Um, and so it, it can be harmful again to, to have that data. Um, and so if it's not needed, consider whether or not you should even be collecting it. And if you are collecting it or utilizing it in any way in your laboratory tests, um, make sure that you use up-to-date uh, up terminology when describing specific population groups. For instance, the term Caucasian um, has definitely fallen out of favor because that is referring really to people from a very specific geographic area. Um, it's not interchangeable necessarily with European ancestry um, or being quote unquote white. And so um, again, make sure that the, the terms that you use are up to date. All right, so now on to um, what are our actual clinical tests that we offer to patients. Um, and this actually is a bit of a research project involving one of our clinical, clinical tests, one that's near and dear to me, because you can see my picture here along with my colleagues, um, Jen Winters, Amber McDonald, and Sean Harrington. Um, and that is in the realm of carrier screening. And so um, this project is to demonstrate what we actually miss in our clinical tests. That is what information um, is our patients and their providers not getting by not adopting more diverse testing. So in the realm of carrier screening, which is testing essentially individuals who are pregnant or planning to become pregnant to see what genetic conditions they may be carriers of and therefore are at risk of having affected offspring with, um, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, as well as the Mer American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, have moved away from the historical practice of recommending only um, carrier screening for a limited number of disorders in very specific populations, such as um, amongst individuals who identify as Ashkenazi Jewish, for instance. They've moved away from that now to recommending population neutral screening instead um, for genetic conditions. And um, these genetic conditions are of a nature that most individuals, as well as their reproductive partners, would consider having a prenatal diagnosis. And so they've expanded beyond population-specific screening, again, are recommending here are some core disorders. Um, they recommend at minimum this, what they call their tier three 
group of disorders, which is over 100 different conditions. And this should be offered to everybody, again, regardless of what they identify as or who they identify as. Um, but what we found in practice is we have our own carrier screening um, test that we launched uh, a little over a year ago, um, which contains a variety of different gene targets, and we have different suborbitals of that test. Um, amongst the first 8,000 patients that we received orders for testing for, the vast majority of them, so by far and large, 98% plus of them, were actually only ordered um, for testing of cystic fibrosis, not the other um, tier three conditions or even tier one conditions as defined by ACMG and ACOG. And um, that's interesting. Uh, cystic fibrosis is, of course, the most common autosomal recessive monogenic disorder in the U.S., but it's not the most common one worldwide. And again, even here in the U.S., our population is becoming increasingly diverse. And um, this disorder is typically associated in individuals of Northern European ancestry, often who identify as white. And so it's not even inclusive to only offer testing for this single condition. And again, it goes against professional medical society guidelines. But nevertheless, again, of um, the, our first 8,000 patients tested, 98% of them only had testing for um, CF or cystic fibrosis only. And so our um, discovery yield or diagnostic yield in those first 8,000 patients or roughly 8,000 patients that had CF only testing, um, it was seven, about 7%. So about 7% of these patients had reportable variants um, in the CFTR gene, which is, which is associated with cystic fibrosis. If you were to, and we have these additional targets on the methodology that we use for this test, if you were to expand that testing to include um, spinal muscular atrophy, which is the second most common autosomal recessive monogenic condition um, in the US um, after CF, your diagnostic yield goes up a little bit to 8% instead. So again, if you're only ordering CF only testing, you're gonna miss out on an additional 1% of patients who also are carriers or who are only carriers of spinal muscular atrophy. If we then expand that or we unmask and get the other targets on our methodology to include things like hemoglobinopathies, um, which are the most common monogenic disorders worldwide, not within the US, as well as fragile X syndrome, then your diagnostic yield goes up to 9% instead. So 9% of samples um, that had testing ordered for all of these conditions, not just cystic fibrosis, actually had positive reports or would have had positive reports. So what if then we looked at all of the tier three as defined by ACMG targets that, that nearly um, are over 100 strong list of different genetic disorders, again, that the professional societies are recommending testing for at minimum. If we were to look at all of those tier three targets in these first 8,000 patients that we received testing orders for um, who mostly had CF only testing, um, you had an astonishing nearly 5,000 reportable variants detected in over 150 different genes on the panel. And um, we know from our own colleagues in obstetrics and gynecology, as well as maternal fetal medicine here at Mayo Clinic Rochester, um, that a number of patients, approximately 10% in their clinical experience, actually carry more than one condition. And so if we were to just take into account that 10% of people are actually carriers of more than one condition, um, a whopping 55% of these first 8,000 cases would have had positive reports. I want you to think about that for a moment. Again, if they, they well, sorry, they mostly had CF only testing. CF only testing yielded about 7% of cases having positive reports. That goes all the way up to 55%. If you again, broaden um, what you're testing for to be more inclusive of um, genes that cause disorders in a variety of different populations, not mostly in just one. And so this data from our own clinical experience really shows that offering population neutral rather than population specific carrier screening um, really does make a difference. And this is what patients and providers are missing out on by only ordering a test for a single condition that is more prevalent in one particular population as opposed to worldwide. Okay, 
So moving on then um, to actual EID related research um, by our colleagues here in the clinical lab, it's well known that representation um, in research um, such as clinical trials um, continues to be a challenge. And this is due, of course, to a variety of different historical and other reasons. But a startling real life example of this at play and why we need to change um, how we do outreach and how we recruit for research was observed by my colleagues, um, Dr. Yifei Young, as well as um, her graduate student, Sarah Vettelson Trutza. And so they actually had a study of um, biomarkers that could potentially improve the diagnosis of, as well as um, the potential prognostic indicators of um, asthma and allergic conditions. And these are two, of course, pretty common medical conditions. Um, but when looking at just doing a chart review of who has asthma and allergic conditions and then who they were able to recruit for their study, it was, it was pretty staggering. First of all, um, individuals who identified as white females made up the majority of both adults um, and pediatric, um, or sorry, the, of adult asthma patients, whereas individuals who identified as or were identified as white males made up the majority of um, pediatric asthma and allergy cases. And so already, um, again, these are pretty common disorders. Already it makes you wonder, or it begs the question, you know, is this being underreported or, undi or underdiagnosed? in certain population groups. On top of that, when they tried to recruit um, participants for their study, they found a, a significant difference, um, again, in the demographic factors of who was willing to enroll or not. Um, so you can see um, in the, on the left, for instance, you know, of the, the um, white female patients that they contacted um, with adult asthma, they were able to achieve, you know, over 60% enrollment. But for individuals who were non-white, um, the numbers were, were much lower, you know, only 6% or 2%, and I apologize for how small the print appears on the slide, were able, or wanted to, sorry, to enroll in the study. And so what they found is that, you know, for this particular study, white female participants were by far and large the most likely to enroll. And this was across different age, uh, ages as well as disease groups. And so having skewed um, demographics like this amongst your study cohort, obviously it limits the representation in your data. And therefore that limits the possibility um, to address disparities in health that are linked to such factors as um, you know, REA, for instance, age, sex, et cetera. And um, again, startlingly, they did actually try um, specific outreach efforts to help bolster the participation by individuals um, who come from historically disenfranchised communities. And these were unsuccessful at improving their enrollment rates. So clearly we, we need to do better. Um, more needs to be done in order to achieve representation and research. And again, this was just our own real life experience with that for one particular study. All right, so now let's talk about um, a research example that uncovered how clinical tests themselves can actually be biased um, and this was a, and therefore unequitable. This was a project um, led by my colleagues, Dr. Linda Bond, as well as Dr. Alech Kolilat, um, who is now at Oregon Health Sciences University, but um, she did train at Mayo. And so this, this project pertains to multiple myeloma. So just a bit of background. Uh, multiple myeloma is the second most common hematologic malignancy. We have about 35,000 new cases and approximately 13,000 deaths in the U.S. for multiple myeloma um, annually. The median age of diagnosis for multiple myeloma is about 65 years, and only about 2% of cases occur in individuals who are under 40 years of age. Um, unfortunately, this particular blood cancer largely remains incurable. Um, the median five-year survival rate amongst patients is a little over 50%. Um, there is a male predominance um, when it comes to multiple myeloma, and um, it's been published and is known that uh, multiple myeloma disproportionately affects um, individuals who identify as Black or African American. Despite that, the, the fact that multiple myeloma disproportionately affects this particular population, um, only 5% of clinical trials and only 2% of translational research studies actually include 
um, patients of this particular um, ancestral background. So again, representation continues to be a challenge and how can we best serve patients from underrepresented communities if we don't have representation in our studies. Um, but what the study focused on was, again, the, the, the clinical test itself. And so um, fluorescence and C2 hybridization, or FISH for short, is um, considered the current gold standard for detecting genetic or genomic abnormalities that can impact um, prognosis as well as therapeutic management in multiple myeloma. Um, and copy number gains of certain chromosomes, um, namely the odd number chromosomes, such as chromosome number 15 or chromosome 15, are actually considered more favorable. And so it's really important, again, for prognostication purposes to be able to detect these and report them. Um, and it, looking specifically at chromosome 15, um, gains of chromosome 50, 15 actually occur in about 40% of multiple myeloma cases. So again, this is associated with a more favorable prognosis. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, monosomy 15 or having loss of a copy of chromosome 50, 15 is rarely observed, um, which is a good thing because this is, again, associated with a less favorable prognosis. But unfortunately, where we do observe this, at least in our own clinical lab, 77% um, of cases of monosoma 15, monosoma 15 are in um, patients of African ancestry. And when we performed, or I should say my, I'm using the royal we, when my colleagues performed mate pair sequencing, which is a next generation sequencing or NGS based um, approach to looking at, um, looking for structural variants and um, other genomic abnormalities um, on samples that previously had fish performed on them, they actually found um, that there was a discrepancy in the number of cases with monosoma, monosoma 15. That is, um, the number of copies of chromosome 15 that were um, detected were, were not the same between the two methods. And so in six out of 70 cases, or about 9% of cases of multiple myeloma that they looked at with monosoma 15, there was a discrepancy between, again, FISH and mate pair seek. And so um, they wanted to explore this further. And so they started testing um, non-plasma cells, which should be reflective of the germline of, of these individuals for monosomy 15 by fish. Um, and they found, and other methods, and they found that um, of these samples that had quote unquote monosomy 15, over 90% of them actually had this quote unquote abnormality in both their plasma cells and non-plasma cells. That's not possible. Um, again, having this present at germline um, is normally not compatible with life. And so to see this was pretty startling. And so when they did further studies, um, i.e. in this case, looking at G-banded chromosomes or conventional chromosome analysis, they saw that actually in um, these cases, there were two copies of chromosome 15 present, not just one. And so the conventional chromosome studies were um, concordant with what they were observing by mate pair seek. But again, FISH is the current gold standard um, of testing for multiple myeloma. But monosomy 15 by FISH, as they alarmingly discovered, um, is false positive in a significant number of cases. And again, monosomy 15 is associated with a less favorable prognosis. And so it's something that you don't want to get wrong in a patient. Um, and so what they found in their investigations of this is that there was a commonly used, um, it's commercially available probe um, that they utilize for the assay and it's utilized elsewhere for this assay actually fails to hybridize to a particular, re or to a particular region, the centromeric region of chromosome 15. And so they looked into why is that the case? Um, and on top of that, they were looking at demographics of, of their patients. And so looking at these false positive cases, they found that three quarters of these false positive cases were actually in individuals um, for whom self-reported patient race data was available. 75% um, of these occurred in individuals who identified as African-American. And so they looked at data, genomic data from the um, publicly available 1000 Genomes Project, and they found that there are actually deletions, um, centromeric deletions in the region that's covered by that fish probe that was yielding the false positive results um, that are um, more prevalent in individuals of African ancestry. 
Um, they also looked at samples um, using uh, the geographic population structure origins algorithm um, to see that um, Northwestern African ancestry in particular was associated with an increased risk of having um, false positive monosomy 15 by fish or a higher likelihood of having variants like this that can interfere with the performance of your probes and again, yield the wrong result. And so again, that was really breathtaking data to see. So already there's a healthcare dis or there's a health disparity in that multiple myeloma is occurring um, more frequently in a particular population group. And on top of that, depending on your testing methodology, even your gold standard test, um, your false positive rate can be higher in that very same population group. All right, so um, for this last leg of my presentation, I'd like to highlight some of the ways that um, DLMP, or again, the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic um, is advancing EID in our workplace and supporting um, our increasingly diverse staff. And so um, we actually have numerous strategies that we've um, put into place for, again, advancing EID in the clinical lab. I'm um, starting with, we actually have an official committee that we've established, um, as well as a network of what we call our EID champions, consisting of, it's now grown to over 150 of our own staff across different work units or across different clinical labs within our department um, to really, again, help advance initiatives, raise awareness, educate each other, and others um, in this space. And um, the mission of our committee, as well as our um, champion network, and we actually have our own logo or uh, logo design, which is uh, depicted in the upper right, is um, really to diversify our workforce and create and sustain an inclusive and equitable work environment where all differences are valued, um, all individuals feel empowered um, to achieve and contribute to their fullest potential to meet the needs of all patients. And everyone also feels empowered to bring their best authentic selves to work. And so we have a number of strategic goals um, as part of this committee that we work on every year, um, as well as a budget that the department has set aside to help us achieve those goals. And um, some of those strategic focuses or goals that we have are enhancing inclusion, as well as a culture of belonging amongst our staff, um, growing and sustaining um, diversity in our workforce, promoting equity in our workforce, um, growing and maintaining um, strategic partnerships with local underserved communities here in the Rochester area, um, as well as sustaining EID using data-driven approaches. Again, we're a clinical lab, we're all scientists, we love data. And so we can harness that data, of course, to enhance EID. And then to increase transparency and accountability um, in the EID space through communications with our staff and throughout the department. And so, um, some of the examples of um, EID at work are, the, again, the, the projects and initiatives in flight um, or completed by our committee as well as champion groups um, are in the realm of volunteerism, for instance. We have um, a, a curated calendar of volunteer activities that are um, opportunities all throughout the community that we've been informed of or we've sought out, reaching out to local organizations such as our local branch of the NAACP, for instance. Um, we have a calendar of those, a sign-up sheet that we have for anybody who's interested in participating in those events. Um, again, so we're out there, we're contributing to the community um, beyond just in the realm of clinical testing. Um, we also have worked and continue to work hard at establishing safe and inclusive spaces. So things like ensuring that we have an adequate number of lactation rooms and that they have adequate availability. Um, it has been important. Um, in addition to that, um, establishing spiritual spaces or meditation rooms also is important because um, we have an increasingly diverse population of individuals when it comes to, again, spiritual practices. And so um, one of the creative ways we're getting around having limited spaces for this is that um, ever since the pandemic, an increasing number of our staff have moved to remote or partly remote positions. And so individuals that might have an office space, for instance, um, available when they're remote, we're creating this sign-up sheet and calendar where if anybody wants to have a private space to, to pray, for instance, or to meditate, or to, again, um, 
express their spirituality, they can sign up and reserve that office that isn't being used by that individual because they're remote that week, for instance, or they're on holiday, um, they can utilize that. And so uh, again, creative ways to be more inclusive of our staff. Um, another thing that we've done is actually, because again, we love data, <laughs> we actually conducted um, an EID climate survey um, of our department staff to um, identify and hopefully address through our various strategic initiatives, the major needs that they themselves have expressed to us. So on the right is some of the data that we gathered from that climate survey. Um, we have um, between DLMP and Mayo Collaborative Services, because we included those staff as well um, in this climate survey, and DLMP does work closely with that group. We have over 6,000 staff members, and of those 6,000 staff, um, amongst DLMP alone, we had about a 1,300 or we had about 1,300 participants respond and complete the survey, which was really impressive for us. Um, oftentimes surveys are unpopular and who has the time for them, for instance. And so um, we were really happy to see that. And um, again, on the right is a depiction of some of the data that we were able to uncover by just doing a thematic analysis of their responses to the various questions, which included free text answers. So if they, um, there were a number of questions where they could write in, you know, what is your experience of, of this? Or how often have you experienced that? And what realms have you experienced um, something related to EID? And what we found um, were that the um, number one issues identified by our staff in the EID space were sense of belonging, um, which is not a surprise, especially in this peri-pandemic, you know, stage that we're in right now worldwide and um, wanting more engagement from as well as representation and leadership. And so, again, that gives us really key data to then structure um, what we focus on and prioritize each year um, amongst our committee as well as champion groups. And so um, another thing that we've done um, to help promote EID at work is um, we increase awareness and education in the EID space through um, forums such as our DLMP town halls. These are um, grand rounds type um, presentations that we um, offer every week. And there are actually ones that are dedicated specifically to EID. Um, in the past, these had more of an operational focus or during the pandemic, they were to keep everybody aware. Where are we at with COVID testing, for instance? Um, what's coming you know, from the institution to our department that we need to be aware of, but they uh, leader, leadership has um, dedicated, like I said, a certain number of these to, to EID topics. Um, we've developed a lot and launched a, a lot of different online modules um, on EID related topics, you know, things such as unconscious bias, for instance, that people can um, receive continuing education units for um, and again, educate themselves on their own time um, because you don't always have time when you're at the, the clinical lab bench, you know, to watch an online module. Um, and so by having or to participate in a module, especially if it's a, a real time one in person. And so having online modules, again, lets people consume these um, or consume this education at the rate and, and when and where they want to. Um, and then we have a number of um, various champion activities by our EAD champions group. So they have fundraising events, for instance, that they put together. They have newsletters for their particular work units where they introduce various topics related to EID. So um, lots of great work going on, lots of work still left to be done, however. And so um, I want to end of one really great example of um, a novel teaching and group learning approach that we're testing out actually um, in the EID space, and that is our adaptation of Project ECHO. And so ECHO stands for Extension of Community Healthcare Outcomes, um, and was actually developed by Dr. Sanjeev Bora at um, the University of New Mexico as a collaborative model of medical education as well as care management. And so what this was doing was essentially telehealth. It was bringing together clinical experts from all over the country um, to help with certain cases, because again, um, individuals functioning and isolating or, or and isolating, sorry, in isolation are always um, going to have less optimal outcomes than when you can have individuals all across the US, all across the world come together to tackle a particular problem or disease state, et cetera. And so, um, Dr. Tia Balcom has really been spearheading our adaptation of this in the EID space um, in DLMP. And so what she's created um, 
utilizing the uh, principles uh, espoused by Project ECHO are these small, um, real-time, interactive, what we call micro-learning sessions. Because again, um, who has the time to, to do you know, a full one-hour lecture, for instance? So she has these short micro-learning sessions that she's developed that explore various EID topics um, using actual cases that have been submitted anonymous, anonymously by our staff. So a staff member might have experienced discrimination for instance, or unconscious bias, um, they could submit a case related to that and we would use that. We would share that, of course, de-identify de um, with participants of these micro learnings and then talk about them. And so by doing this, we could all increase our knowledge regarding EID. Um, we could all together um, learn techniques for improving our discussion of sensitive topics in this EID space. And most importantly, we could network together and problem solve together um, with colleagues as well as subject matter experts in the EID space. Um, so that was really valuable. And again, it was these short bite-sized chunks. And so people could easily incorporate that into their day-to-day -day work activities. Um, and lastly, we, through this approach, we could formulate strategies together as a small group um, for alignment and communication in the EID space. And so we just wrapped up our first year of this and I'm really looking forward to um, seeing the overall data from this. And then hopefully Dr. Balka will be publishing that soon too of how successful this has been. And again, increasing knowledge and awareness of EID within our department here at Mayo. All right. And so I would just like to conclude with a single statement. Um, and it's one that I already mentioned earlier but I hope I've now proven it to you um, with the examples that I've given through this talk. And that is that um, equitably and inclusively supporting our diverse staff, as well as diverse patients, can reduce disparities in healthcare delivery. Um, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion uh, improves healthcare outcomes, period. And I hope, again, that you've seen examples of that in the talk today. With that, I would like to thank you all for taking this whirlwind tour <laughs> through EID at DLMP here at Mayo in Rochester, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Linda, for your very informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A session or the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, if you happen to have any questions that you would like to ask, please do so now. Just submit a question in the ask a question box located at the bottom of your screen. All right, let's go ahead and get started. The first one we have here is what are some things that your clinical labs are looking into to further assist underserved communities? That's a great question, Sydney. Thank you for asking that. Um, some of the things that uh, DLMP here at Mayo um, is exploring or are exploring to help um, underserved communities are through our clinical tests themselves. So I gave some examples in the presentation, but ways we can go even further are things like adopting measures to improve the accessibility of our tests, right? Like a lot of patients don't even have the ability to go to a clinic you know, just to have their blood drawn, for instance, for a clinical test. And so we're looking into things like self-collection kits that we can send to patients and then they can send back and have the testing performed on that. Um, we're looking at things such as uh, mobile testing units that can go out and collect samples from patients as well. Um, and then finally, we're looking at ways that we can provide free testing um, to individuals too. That's another way that the clinical lab can help serve individuals from historically disinvested communities is by offering pro bono testing. And so we have various mechanisms by which we can achieve that. And again, we're always looking for more. Perfect. All right, thank you. We do have another here. What are some or some other unique barriers that your clinical labs have faced when it comes to improving the EID of your tests? Yeah, it's interesting. In the clinical lab space, there, there are some barriers that are unique to us as opposed to the research lab. So again, clinical labs perform clinical testing. These are results that you know medical providers are basing decisions on. These go in a patient's medical chart, et cetera. And so um, in order to generate these you know, test result reports that then go in charts, we have to use a laboratory information software system. 
And we're always limited by how those laboratory information software systems are built. And so if they have any constraints, those constraints are then passed on to us. And so um, if your laboratory information system, for instance, was only built um, with the field for sex and not gender identity, then you could be led astray by that. Or you might have a situation where if you have a test that can um, look at things like chromosomal sex, it might reveal a discrepancy in your, your patient sample versus what was on the paperwork reported by that patient. And that can necessitate a whole slew of investigations. You know, you might end up calling that provider saying, hey, you know, this patient's reported sex doesn't match what we're seeing on this test. Um, and in some cases, that could even be an incidental finding, which the patient doesn't even want to know about. And so what do you do in cases like that? Like if you incidentally uncover a sex chromosome aneuploidy, for instance, in an individual, um, or you might have a situation where the provider says, you know, I didn't need to know that. That's not even the test that I ordered from you. Why are you even calling me? Um, and it's all because, again, we didn't we either had inaccurate information or we didn't have a field where a provider who mm -hmm. serves a large transgender population could enter gender identity on there instead. And so we'd have both. And so um, that's one example that I can think of off the top of my head. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. We do have a few more here. Um, do you see the same engagement in EID activities among senior versus junior staff? That is an excellent question. Um, from what I've observed thus far, yes, we actually have both senior staff as well as junior staff engaged in this. Um, and, and so that has been really heartening to see. Great. Okay, it looks like we have one final question here. Not everyone is comfortable with or as open to embracing EID in the workplace. How has your department approached this situation? Yeah, that's also a great question. And so um, there, there will always be individuals who are at um, different points in their EID journey. And just like you mentioned, Sydney, not everybody is comfortable with that topic. Some some individuals may be like, I, you know what, I don't want to learn in this space, or I already feel like I know enough, you know, I'm, I'm good. And so how can we still be inclusive and respectful of those individuals, but still promote EID and advance it in the workplace? Um, the way our department has approached this is, you know, in things like our communications and our, our educational offerings, we try to remind our staff that, um, for instance, EID is not about politics. Even though it is often politicized, um, what we are here to do and accomplish together is just learning. Um, another approach we've taken is just reminding individuals that, you know, these, these interactions that we have should be safe spaces, all are welcome in them, and we have to be open-minded and curious just because your beliefs might defer or how accepting you are um, or engaged and invested you are in EID might be different. That's nothing personal, of course, or it could be personal to you, but it has nothing to do with me. And um, I can learn from that as well, for example. You know, tell me more about why it is that you don't believe in this or um, how can I help you with that? Um, or what is it about you that you can help me understand better too, so that we can still work together and be collaborative and again, uplift one another as opposed to having um, inequitable and uninclusive experiences at work. Mm -hmm. Perfect, all right, thank you so much. So that concludes the questions that have come in today. Linda, do you happen to have any final comments for our audience? Um, I do not, again, just wanna thank everybody again for joining me on this. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Linda, for your time today and for your important research. Before we go, I would like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their very interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. Lab Roots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.